States. James Comey was appointed director of the FBI after a distinguished career as a prosecutor and public servant. He was a registered Republican appointed by the Democratic president, Barack Obama. His tenure as FBI chief will forever be associated with two investigations, one into Hillary Clinton's misuse of personal email and the other into allegations of Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Mr. Comey's decisions led to his vilification on both sides of America's partisan divide and his own recently published memoir, which delivered a withering condemnation of the man who fired him from the FBI, President Donald Trump, simply added fuel to the political firestorm. So has James Comey ultimately sullied his own reputation by stepping into America's political swamp? Well, I'm delighted to say he joins me now. James Comey, welcome to Hard Talk. Thanks for having me on, Stephen. You have described yourself as a man who finds it uncomfortable to be in the limelight, the spotlight, and yet for the last two years that's precisely where you have been and presumably chosen to be. So how come? Well, as FBI director, I was stuck there. I ended up as the referee in the middle of the nastiest World Cup football match or an America's soccer match we'd ever seen. And then since I got fired, I decided I couldn't look myself in the mirror if I didn't share my view of what ethical leadership should look like. And so involuntarily for the first part, voluntarily now. But I suppose it invites people to wonder whether there is an element of personal ego, even of vanity in the way you have conducted yourself in this highly contentious period. Oh, sure. That's a totally reasonable question. I hope not about the period now, and I will prove it's not about me trying to be famous by going away. Once this period is over, you won't recognize me in airports anymore. But before that, sure, I get why people ask that. It's not true. And if people stare at the way we made decisions, we realize it wasn't about ego. Well, you say it's not true, but then I reflect, and your memoir is interesting about this because you talk a lot about your early career, and you talk about the way you saw working in New York as a prosecutor with the chief prosecutor in New York at the time, Rudy Giuliani. And you say, it took me a while to realize that Giuliani's confidence was not leavened with a whole lot of humility. The cost of that imbalance was that there was very little oxygen left for others. Now that you've got some distance from what's happened over the past two years, and particularly your conduct as leader of the FBI, do you think you fell into the same trap? No, because I learned from those mistakes and my own weaknesses. Look, I thought, as my mother used to say, I was hot stuff when I was a younger person and met an amazing woman and had lots of people around me who beat that out of me. So when I became director of the FBI, I surrounded myself with people who would tell me when I was being a fool, tell me when I was being impulsive, tell me when I was wrong. You've just been told by the Inspector General of the Justice Department who spent a year and a half looking at your leadership, your behaviors when you were handling the Hillary Clinton emails investigation, the Inspector General has concluded that you acted at times with an extreme form of insubordination. I mean, that, that's impulsive. That suggests that in the end it was about you and your determination to do it your way. Yeah, I don't think so, though. I, it's fair criticism but not based on decisions made in impulse. I knew exactly what I was doing and made careful consideration, argued about it with my senior staff and decided the best way to protect the institutions of justice was to separate myself from my boss, who was then the Attorney General of the United States, Loretta Lynch. I knew what I was doing, but wasn't doing it impulsively, wasn't doing it out of anger or a fit of pique or ego. I was doing it because I thought it was the best of two bad choices. One was bad, the other was worse, and so I chose bad. But it's a big word in insubordination, particularly for a guy who has spent a lot of time saying that his commitment is entirely to institutional integrity, to the rule of law, and to due process. And what you did, and to remind people, what you did in July of 2016 was ignore due process when you took it upon yourself to go out there and tell the United States and the world that you were closing the investigation into Hillary Clinton's misuse of emails and that there would be no charges brought. That was insubordination. Yes, in the Inspector General's view, and I had an emotional reaction when they called me insubordinate for the reasons you said, but I actually think it's fair, and I did it on purpose. And it's not about due process, because 
Really? really? You were saying you're bigger than the system, bigger than the institutions and the proper way to do things. No, no, no. I'm saying I'm a servant of the institutions. I respect the norms of the institution. The norm would be I'd stand next to the Attorney General. But given the circumstances and her compromise in the public eye in America, if I care about the institution, I can't do it the normal way. There's nothing normal about this. And so as a servant of the institution, I had to do something I knew would be bad for me personally, but to step away from the Attorney General and speak as we would speak together, but speak separately. You didn't just choose to break the rules, if I can put it that way, in that sense. You also explicitly... Uh, blamed Mrs. Clinton for what you called extremely careless behaviors in a way that again was unprecedented because here you were declaring that no charges were to be brought and normally again under due process in the American system if no charges were to be brought you wouldn't go on to detail her misbehaviors and again the inspector general says quote this violated long-standing department practice and protocol yeah, only in this respect, though. You're right that in the normal case, when we close an investigation, we say nothing. But for many, many years, in cases of ex extensive public interest, the Department of Justice has long talked about the conduct of people who were not charged. We've done it, in fact, twice it had happened in the months before this announcement, for good reason. The difference here was where I departed from practice is, I didn't do it with the Attorney General. Normally, we'd let her take the lead. I did. Exactly. exactly. So exactly you were right. putting the post that you held, director of the FBI, before the United States public and the world in a way that was deeply exposing. You were being political. I respectfully, I don't agree. I was being deeply respectful of American confidence in the systems of justice and thought the only way... The least bad way to maintain that confidence is to offer transparency. I wasn't trying to attack Hillary Clinton. I was trying to be transparent with the American people so they could have confidence in the result. In my judgment, and others could think differently, and I respect that, but I thought and still think if I do it next to the Attorney General, who just had a private meeting with Bill Clinton on a private aircraft, the American people will not have confidence in the results. So in essence, in, in this part of an extraordinarily sensitive and contentious legal process, you were playing God. Yeah, <laughs> hardly. If I were playing God, I could have seen the future, uh, and, and that would have made me a much better leader. I was making judgments in the middle of a terrible situation. Think about this. One of the two candidates for President of the United States is under criminal investigation, and the Attorney General, rather than step out of the case, says, I'll accept Jim Comey's recommendation handed me this whole thing. All I did was say, you know what, I'm going to give my recommendation, but I'm going to do it separately so the American people understand it was done well and they can rely upon it. We, we've got a lot, a lot to get through, so let's, let's then get on to the next key decision that you had to take, and that was when you learned, and it's kind of complicated, but when you learned, actually just a few days before election day, November 2016, that, that a, a new store of Hillary Clinton emails had been found bizarrely in the laptop computer belonging to former Congressman Anthony Weiner, uh, you again took the unilateral decision that you had to tell the American Congress and the American public that you were reopening the investigation into Hillary Clinton just literally 11 days yeah. before polling day. Yeah. And you must have known that that was going to have an extraordinary impact on people's political thinking. I knew it might have some impact. I didn't know what impact. But I saw two choices. If I could do that, which is really bad and inconsistent with the norms I've lived under my entire career in the Department of Justice, or I could conceal that we had restarted the investigation. Two choices, both really bad, one significantly worse than the other. Speaking would be bad. Concealing that what we now knew to be a lie to the American people during the summer, that we're done here and you can rely on that, that that was no longer true, I think would be devastating but, but, to the institution. But, but it just makes one thing statement. I didn't do it unilaterally. I told the Attorney General, I think I need to do this. But it, it turned out that you actually had time to go through the emails to find out whether there was anything new and significant in them and conclude there wasn't before Election Day. So why not get your staff to double-team it to figure out those emails weren't important before Election Day rather than run the risk of... of changing the result of that election. Yeah, that's where being actually godlike would have been a wonderful thing. I couldn't see the future. On October 28th, 11 days before the election, the investigative team said, sir, 
We cannot finish this review before the election. Well, that was plain wrong, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't plain wrong. Based on what they knew then, we didn't have the capability to go through hundreds of thousands of emails because you couldn't bring in the recruits like you're searching for a crime scene weapon. You had to read them overnight, overnight, overnight. And they built a software system to cut it down to 6,000 emails. So they finished the Sunday before the election. But again, I can't live life backwards. On October 28, 2016, I'm being told in ways that are credible, we cannot finish this before the election. So what do I do? Do I speak or do I conceal? The bottom line here is that, that Hillary Clinton, to this day, believes that you cost her the election. Not that, you know, the, the election wasn't close. It was clearly going to be close anyway. But you cost her the election because you tilted a significant body of opinion against her because people thought she was yet again under suspicion, cloud of suspicion, and she blames you. And I wonder whether right now you're still haunted by the thought that you, in essence, dictated the result of that election. I'm not haunted by it, but I carried around a sense of slight sickness in my stomach because we don't want to have any impact on the election at all in the FBI. We'd rather not be on the field during this particular game. When we're on the field, we have to choose between two options. We can't consider the political outcome. Because if we do that, we're just another partisan player in Washington. One of my lawyers asked me right before that, should you consider that you may help elect Donald Trump president? And I said, great question. I can't, because down that road lies the death of the FBI. I have to decide what's the right thing given the values of this institution. Do I speak or do I conceal? Let's now turn to you and Donald Trump. It seems to me that in your dealings with Donald Trump from the very get-go, from your first meeting with him before the inauguration in, in January of, of 2017, you, very far from bringing a blank slate to your view of him, to your meetings with him, you were deeply suspicious and skeptical of Trump from the start. And that comes out clearly in your recollections in your memoir. Sure, that's because I'm a human being. It's not a political judgment. I evaluate people who work for me. I evaluate people I work for. And my it, 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 with respect, it becomes political if you're from the very get-go likening the way in which Trump deals with you and with situations, likens him to a, a mafia don, a mafia boss. I mean, that, that's not just personal. That becomes political. I don't see it as political. I, I didn't th think he was... The director of the FBI th concluding that Donald Trump from your earliest meetings is, in essence, the political equivalent of a mafia boss? Sure, not in the sense that he's robbing banks, but in the leadership culture he creates. That's what struck me. That's not a political judgment. That's a judgment based on reason and logic and experience. Some of what you write, and I'm guessing it's based on contemporaneous notes, it is actually just downright personal. Some of the asides about... You know, his look, his hair, the size of his hands, which you were making observations like this in the very earliest meetings with him, suggests you had an animus towards him. Yeah, I reject that. If you read my book, you'll see I'm actually trying to be an author, and as an investigator, I have a pretty good eye for detail. So I describe my high school boss, I describe other bosses, I describe people I worked with in great detail. And so, yes, I noticed Donald Trump's hair color, how he dressed, how he sat, how he spoke. That's not a political judgment, that's an observation. Let, let, let's talk about the way you handled incredibly important encounters. One in particular, where Donald Trump asked you if he could count on your loyalty. You were deeply uncomfortable. You knew that that wasn't actually the nature of the relationship as it was supposed to be between president and head of the FBI. But you didn't confront him. You didn't take him on. You didn't say, Mr. President, that's not the way it works. No, I didn't. Why not? I don't think I had the presence of mind in the moment. I was so shocked by the explicit demand for loyalty that all I could think of to do in the moment was just stare at him and not react. I got better towards the end of the conversation, but in the moment, it was the best I could do. In hindsight, I can think of all kinds of things I could do better in that conversation, but that's the way it was in the moment. Because since then, you've written, it is wrong to stand idly by or stay silent when you know better. Do you feel you let yourself down? Not in general in that conversation. Like I said, because I ended up interrupting him to give him a bit of a tutorial on how it should be. But in the moment, if I were more experienced and had the presence of mind, I might have said, Mr. President, you can't do that. And again, another crucial encounter, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but this one was the bizarre 
uh, at the dinner inside the White House when Donald Trump raised the case of, of Michael Flynn. That was uh, Valentine's Day in the Oval Office. Okay, in the Oval Office. And he expressed the hope that you could, quote, let it go. Do you believe, in retrospect, that that was the president, in essence, performing an act that amounted to obstruction of justice? I don't know whether it adds up to legal obstruction of justice. I understood him to be asking me to drop a criminal investigation, which could be obstruction but of you justice. You didn't say that to him. You didn't say, Mr. President, that is deeply inappropriate. I simply abide by the truth, the rule of law, and the Constitution. You didn't say any of that. I did not. I guess the question you'd have to ask him is if you didn't know that was inappropriate, why did you clear the room and eject the Attorney General of the United States so he could speak to me alone? But no, I didn't in the moment give the President of the United States a tutorial. Trump um, now calls you Lion Jim Comey. You, in turn, have called him a liar. You've called him many worse things as well. You've said that you believe he threatens the values and the institutions that you believe the United States represents. How damaging to trust both in your old institution, the FBI, and the presidency is the mud that you and Donald Trump are throwing at each other? I actually don't see it as throwing mud. I don't tweet insults at him. I am out trying to offer a picture of what ethical leadership should look like in this book. I have to talk about him if I'm going to describe ethical leadership. And so I really don't think of it as a mud fight. And well, I I, I, you may not call it mud, but let me just give you a few of your choice quotes. Trump is unethical. Trump is untethered to the truth. Trump tells lies. Trump, you say, is morally unfit to be president. Mm -hmm. That's not mud. That, to my mind, is the truth. And if I don't speak the truth now as an American... You say categorically that is the truth. You know that at least 40% of Americans who are still resolute supporters of Donald Trump, Trump will be listening to this interview and will say, how dare Jim Comey come out with these opinions of his and declare with such righteousness that this is the truth. But I actually think they agree with me in the main. Even if you support Donald Trump, you know he lies all the time. You just think it's for a greater good. No serious person believes more people attended his inauguration than Barack Obama's inauguration. And lots and lots of other lies. The difference is, is that okay? And supporters of Donald Trump, in good faith, believe that's okay. Because he's doing so many other things for America. I don't agree with that, but I understand that. Let's tie the lies to the Mueller investigation. You're well placed to know more than almost any human being about what is Robert Mueller's focus, because you, for example, were still leading the FBI investigation when you got that so-called Russia dossier built up by the former British agent Christopher Steele, which had some extraordinary allegations, sensational allegations about what Donald Trump may have gotten up to in Moscow on a trip some years ago, and which ex seemed on the face of it to potentially offer up an explanation for collusion with the Russians if he were vulnerable to blackmail. Did, did you believe that dossier when you saw it? I believed the very core allegation of the dossier, which was consistent with other intelligence we already had. That was that the Russians were interfering in the American presidential election. The rest of it, I didn't know what to make of. And some of it, I didn't care whether it was true or false. The prostitute thing, I didn't care whether that was true or false. I just wanted the president to be aware. Surely you must have cared whether Donald Trump was potentially vulnerable to blackmail. Yes, which is why we told him about that, so he would know about the allegation and know the FBI was aware of it. In the event it was some leverage by the Russians, that would reduce their ability to coerce him. But again, I don't know, and I was fired before I got the answer. The FBI was trying to figure out, we know the core allegation is true in the dossier. How much of the rest of this can we verify or rule out? And I don't know where it ended up. You were fired in May 2017. Of course, the, the legwork in the continuance of this long investigation into the alleged Russian interference uh, is now being uh, undertaken by Robert Mueller. Have you spoken to Robert Mueller? No. What's your gut feeling about where that investigation is going and the chances of Donald Trump, let's face it, being impeached and not, not completing a four-year term? I honestly don't know. But won't you be a key witness at some point? Sure. And I'm not going to talk about interactions with anybody on his staff, but I haven't talked to Bob Mueller myself. I don't know where he'll end up. I really don't. And I don't like it that Democrats in the United States wish for a particular result and Republicans. We should all wish he just finds the truth. And that may be not bad for President Trump. I honestly don't know. But if he's left to do his work, he'll find those facts that give us the best view of what the truth is. And everybody should want that, including the President.
I want to end by considering the damage done to the United States by what has happened over the last couple of years. You've, you've stressed the importance, for example, of this so-called reservoir of trust that the FBI, as an investigating agency, has in the United States. I look at the latest surveys, the PBS NewsHour survey shows a dramatic drop in the number of Americans who think that the FBI in all of this was just trying to do its job and a real rise in the number who think that the, the FBI has been biased against the Trump administration. One could argue that those numbers reflect failings in your leadership. Yeah, I understand why you could argue that. And certainly decisions I made, I personally took a big hit for and the institution did. The question I had to ask at the time is what's the alternative and how big would that hit be? But part of the reason that we're taking that hit is the lies being told about the organization. The FBI was on Hillary Clinton's side? That's the allegation? Well, you ought to check that one with Hillary Clinton, who thinks that the FBI cost her the election. If you're going to lie, you have to lie about all the facts, and even these lies don't encompass those facts. We weren't on either side. Again, we were the ref on the field of a bitter match. Everybody ended up mad at us, but because we were doing our job without regard to either team. A final thought, which is a, a big thought about the, the faith Americans have in their government and their institutions and the degree to which they can trust them. How much damage has been done? Significant damage, but not long-lasting damage. The great thing about America is... Its values are so deep and strong, no president, no party can screw it up in the time they hold power. We've been through this before. We, we progress, we retrench. We progress, we retrench. We will be okay. So long as we continue to talk about the values that matter and rise above the political nonsense that normally consumes our time and realize we're a set of ideas and it should matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Can the cycle go on an upswing as long as Donald Trump's in the White House? Yes, in a way. This may sound crazy, but Donald Trump is creating a focus in the United States on truth and our values that was not true two years ago. Look at the number of young people running for office. Look at schools reinstituting civics education. Look at families talking to their kids about respect and prejudice and truth. The change is already happening in a way that he surely doesn't intend. Donald Trump is illuminating what matters in America. Look at the outcry over the children in cages. Republicans, Democrats, independents rose up in the United States and said, look, we may disagree about immigration. This is not America. And he was forced to change that. That is Donald Trump unintentionally awakening the great ethical giant that is America. I'm optimistic. James Comey, thanks. Thank for you. Being on thanks, David. Yeah, thanks for having me.